Okay, good morning everyone. Today we'll continue with our Science of the Brain presentation. It will be part eight today. I hope it will be the last part. Maybe we'll finish a whole bunch of signs. And I think all appearances of the brain have been covered plus or minus, I hope. Okay, so let's continue. What do you think is going on? Oh, okay. What do you think is going on? Infacement of cortical sulci, okay. Edema, cerebral edema. With apparent you know, hyperdensity throughout subarachnoid space. This is what's called pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's not subarachnoid. It's pseudo subarachnoid, okay? Because there is diffuse edema everywhere, resulting in increased dense, relatively increased density of the cortex. What's called pseudo subarachnoid. It has a differential diagnosis of cerebral edema, meningitis, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, intracranial hypotension, and prior contrast administration. Huh? لا, this is pseudo, it's a pseudo subarachnoid. Ah, if it was subarachnoid hemorrhage, I would say subarachnoid hemorrhage. I don't need to use pseudo, okay? So, due to increased attenuation in the subarachnoid space and the basal cistern, it will not always represent as subarachnoid hemorrhage. There is other causes like in diffuse cerebral edema, the brain parenchyma is diffusely hypodense. With loss of gray-white matter distinction, increased intracranial pressure causes displacement of the CSF from the subarachnoid space, as well as engorgement of the superficial veins, yielding a dense appearance of the leptomeninges, the pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage sign. The MR correlate of this finding is known as flare hyperintensity sign. Perfect. The same, uh, this patient, if we did an MRI, it will be what's called the flare hyperintensity sign because the cortex will be edematous, right, in, uh, right on flare and tetuated images in general. Other processes that affect the subarachnoid space include meningitis, as in there will be proteinaceous fluid, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis due to tumor cells, prior contrast administration, which is either intrathecal or intravascular, can happen both. There are some studies on intrathecal gadolinium administration. For how long does this remain this way? What? After contrast. I've done some, yani, see, the iodine imaging, yani CT, not MRI to be honest. So in iodine it will last maybe 24 to 72 hours, something like that. Okay? Bill CT. Bill MRI, I don't know, to be honest. Intracranial hypotension can produce superficial venous engorgement in the pachymeninges and or leptomeninges when there is intracranial hypotension. Okay. So, What's this? This is the fifth corpus callosum. Mm -hmm. And the spleenum of Spine. corpus callosum. This is what, what's called sandwich appearance. Okay? So what do you think is the disease there? And the corpus callosum? At this part of the corpus callosum. Spleenum. No, it's a so you can see the ventral and dorsal layers of the corpus callosum are relatively preserved. Just the mid part is uh, restricted diffusion. This is uh, a sign of Machiava Bignami's disease, okay, which is typically occurring in chronic alcoholics with severe malnutrition, B complex deficiency resulting in degeneration of the corpus callosum, okay which first involves the body, followed by the genu and the spleenum. Other affected areas include anterior and posterior commissures, corticospinal tracts, uh, uh, hemispheric white matter. On the MRI, the corpus callosum appears as T2 hyperintense, T1 hypointense, due to degeneration, as usual. Preferential involvement of the central layer with the relative sparing of the dorsal and ventral layers, creating the sandwich appearance. Okay, due to B-plex deficiency, due to severe malnutrition, usually in alcoholics. In the chronic phase, the region necrose and cavitate and other processes that can affect the corpus callosum includes infarction, demyelination, trauma, in, in cases of diffuse axonal injury also, demyelination MS, of course. However, these entities have this, uh, different clinical presentation and do not typically produce the layered appearance. Just all over hyperintense. Okay? Good. 
So this is a region enhancing heterogeneous intraaxial and the, what's this? What how to describe this small nodule here? Satellite. Satellite lesion. Excellent. So this is a coronal enhanced T1-weighted MR with heterogeneously enhancing right subinsular mass with a second focus of enhancement superior to this and separate from the dominant lesion, which is the satellite lesion. It has a differential diagnosis. Of course, it's an aggressive lesion, definitely. Uh, Either on the chest, it's a benign lesion. I don't know. On the chest. We'll discuss that later. Let us in the brain now, and we'll see the chest later. Anyway, it has differential diagnosis of GBM, metaglioblastoma multiforme, metastasis, and abscess. So, the satellite lesion is a smaller lesion adjacent to, but separate from the primary process. Primary with a small, tiny, adjacent lesion. GBM, which is a highly aggressive infiltrative glioma, Grade 4 WHO classification is the most common primary brain tumor with this appearance. The metastasis can present as multiple discrete masses throughout the brain. Also, daughter abscesses may develop adjacent to the parent abscess, yes. but usually continuous with the parent abscess and evolve rapidly over time with the progressive organization and rim enhancement. So you have the primary lesion, the primary abscess with a small adjacent micro abscesses then over time they evolve unite with the parent lesion become like a whole confluent, confluent lesion yes. okay good now what do you think is going on here no this is a flare Anyone, what, how do you describe the corpus callosum appearance? Leave the T to high, the hyperintense signal. What's, what do you think this appearance here? Wavy Wave or scalloped. The outline is scalloped, okay? And this, uh, outside the, this one they call scalloped. I don't know what it is, but it's different from our scallop, okay? So, uh, it's due to decompressed chronic hydrocephalus, okay? Resulting in uh, atrophic changes of the fibers of the uh, corpus callosum, like in cerebromalacia, for example, you see T2 hyperintensity. So the chronic hydrocephalus produces ventriculomegaly, elevation of the corpus callosum, following CSF drain or shunt placement, the corpus callosum will rapidly descend away from the Falks, the rigid falks, resulting in the dorsal body can develop scalloped appearance. This, when there is hydrocephalus, it will be elevated, compressed against the hydro, the falks. When they decompress it, it gets down. The scalloped appearance will be seen. Mafhum al Okay. Reflecting the tethering by the pericalosal artery branch on the overlying cingulate cortex, it will be on T2 hyperintense, T1 hypointense. Uh, Representing biomic, sorry, biomechanical compression, edema, ischemia, and or demyelination. Okay. So, what's going on here? How do you describe this ventricle? Is it? Large, small, big, uh, it's slit-like. It's a slit-like ventricle, very small ventricle. This appearance can be seen where an increased intracranial pressure and excessive CSF removal. Okay. First of all, there's increased intracranial pressure. We will, I will discuss it later, in just a second. First, there, is a, uh, there are slit-like ventricles. You can see it's so thin and tiny with effacement of the subarachnoid space and gyral remodeling of the inner table, if you can see the subarachnoid space is not very well seen, like we used to see it, indicating chronically increased intracranial pressure, okay? This, the chronic increased intracranial pressure, uh, including what's called pseudotumor cerebri, which is idiopathic intracranial hypertension, supratentorial masses, cerebral edema, can force out the CSF from the ventricle. In pressure increased, the ventricles compressed, forcing the CSF away from the ventricle into the sub into the, su the surrounding space. Okay, 
producing what's called slit-like appearance. Other imaging features include effacement of the subarachnoid space, empty cell, papillodema, venous pseudostenosis, and calvarial remodeling due to the pressure against the bone, okay? And also, you can see the cell looks like empty or partially empty due to the CSF compressed with other cell compressing the uh, pituitary gland. The cavernous sinus, Michael's cave, and the cranial nerves meta can also be narrowed in the acute phase, but expand in the chronic phase. So first they narrow, then they expand, and they increase uh, or changes in the intracranial pressure. Uh, due to the transmitted CSF pulsation, in patients who undergo lumbar puncture, ventricular drainage, or shunting, the cranial compartment is no longer isolated from the external environment. Excessive CSF removal can also produce slit-like ventricle when there is CSF shunting or a CSF drainage for any reason. The ventricles will also collapse because there is no more intracranial pressure, resulting in also slit-like appearance. So it can be due to both hyper and hypotension. It can be seen. Uh, an abnormally low CSF pressure is diagnostic of shunt malfunction. That's over shunting. If CSF pressure is low with a, with a shunt, it's definitely an over shunting. Okay? Good. So, this is an easy one. What was the diagnosis here? Okay. And there is, what's this appearance? No, no, no. This here. What's going on here? Yeah, what does it look like? What do you think is... There is some posterior fossa hemorrhage, let's say, causing mass effect, resulting in ascending transtentorial herniation. This is what's called spinning top or the square or triangle appearance. This is a spinning top, you know? The spinning top, it looks like that, okay? The idea is that when there is there is <coughs> diffuse cerebr cerebral and cerebellar edema, with there will be upward transtentorial herniation, not downward, up. Okay. Uh, with triangular appearance of the quadrigeminal plate cistern and compression of the posterior lateral margin of the midbrain. Okay. Here. In another patient at another level, there will be hemorrhagic edema of the cerebellar vermis with upward transtentorial herniation compressing the posterior mar lateral margin of the midbrain. Okay? This will, uh, there will be the, the square appearance. Yani they are both the same condition but at different levels. If you are up at the midbrain, you will have the square appearance. If you are a little bit down, you will be the spinning top or the triangle appearance. Okay? So, uh, it's a response to increased tracheal pressure caused by hemorrhage, edema, and or mass lesion. How many types of herniation do we know? Five. Which are? The most common one is what? Subfalsine. Okay. Subfalsine herniation. Then we have? The ankle herniation, transtentorial herniation. Ascending and descending, exactly. Okay, and there is an external herniation that's transcalvarial. If there is a bony defect, brain will herniate through it. Okay, craniotomy, brain will hit it. We see it every now and then in post-surgical cases. Okay, so uh, transtentorial herniation refers to herniation across the tentorium cerebelli. It's either descending or ascending, according to the where the pressure is more. If it's supratentorial, it will be descending. If it is infratentorial, it will be ascending, okay? Uh, descending will be, as we said, in, sorry, what's going on? Uh, in increased supratentorial pressure, while uh, ascending will be due to increase in the pressure in the posterior fossa with the effacement of the quadrigeminal plate resulting in triangle or square appearance uh, also, the compression of the posterior lateral midbrain, which is the spinning top appearance. Cerebral, uh, cerebral herniation is an urgent imaging finding, should be addressed with prompt correction of the underlying cause. Additional strategies for lowering intracranial pressure includes mannitol, 
ventriculostomy and decompressive craniotomy. Okay? Now, I thought I can part one. What's the sign? What's the appearance? Star sign, star appearance. Indicating, of course, subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see there are hyperdense material within the supracellular system, which is blood. The hyperdense material is blood. Okay? So, the supracellular system is a CSF filled space here. When there is bleeding, there will be the blood will be hyperdense and uh, resulting in this star appearance. Uh, con uh, the supracellular uh, system contains the optic chiasm, pituitary infundibulum, and the circle of Wallace and the boundaries includes the interhemispheric fissure anteriorly, the un uncus laterally, and the pons and cerebellar pedicles posteriorly. So it's either a, a five-pointed or a six-pointed star according to which level. Okay, it's five-pointed, yeah, in Najma Khumasiya, five-pointed star at the level of the pons, and six-pointed at the level of the uh, cerebellar, uh, cerebral pedicles. There will be two pedicles resulting in the six-pointed appearance. Apparent hyperdensity in the supracellular system includes subarachnoid hemorrhage or it mimics like diffuse cerebral edema, basilar meningitis, leptomeningeal calcinomatosis, prior contrast administration. Loss of the normal star appearance can occur in herniation, transtentorial herniation. The star will be changed. Okay? Good. Could you okay, Hadilan? Inshallah. Tamam. How do you describe this appearance? Heterogeneous. Heterogeneous. Yes. This is a CT scan yes. showing yes. heterogeneous. Yes. Axial. Axial, okay. And the left Okay. So there's some sort of mass with heterogeneous appearance, some calcification. How would you describe this calcification? It looks like uh, stippled. Point dots of calcification. It's not coarse. It's not like popcorn calcification. It's like not like just a scattered, stippled appearance. What do you think is going on? Or what's the differential diagnosis here? Dermoid. Okay. And vascular malformation. Exactly. Like uh, flibolis. Yeah. What's going on? So this is stippled appearance. Showing multiple punctate calcification, calcific fossa in the left cerebellar hemisphere and the vermis, with differential diagnosis of dermoid, epidermoid, and vascular malformation. This punctate calcification usually indicates benign lesion and uh, can be also seen in some malignant brain lesions sometimes. Most classically, the dermoid and epidermoid cysts can show this appearance and come on in vascular lesions, including cavernomas, arteriovenous malformation. Primary and metastatic brain tumors like breast, lung, thyroid, osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma can show this appearance, but ca can calcify, but the calcification usual, usually is coarser and more confluent. Okay, so this dots or tiny stippled calcification, it does not mean benign, but it's more in favor of benign. Okay? Can. Can contain. Okay? We, nev we never say never. Okay? So, this is an easy one. Don't. This is a T2. This is a T2. Subdural effusion, exactly. There is subdural effusion, CSF surrounding the brain. And what uh, the causes are, as usual, intracranial hypotension. Subdural empyema, hygroma, and hematoma at certain ages or stages. The intracranial hypotension is caused by idiopathic or degenerative or traumatic or iatrogenic etiologies. Dural tears in the brain or spine cause continuous CSF leak, resulting in CSF hypovolemia. As the pressure within the intracranial compartment decreases, the brain migrates inferiorly and extending the vein and the CSF spaces, overlying the cerebral convexities. Yeah, and just imagine. Dural tear in the spinal cord, for example, CSF leak, the brain will 
herniate inferiorly, they migrate inferiorly. The, the CSF space around the cerebral convexities will get bigger, resulting in subdural effusion. Other types of, of uh, the subdural collection include empyema, hygroma, which is a CSF containing lesion, subdural hematomas, contains blood. Clinical presentation and correlation with other MR sequences should enable the distinction of these various etiologies. يعني جاي واحد post traumatic, post surgical, we should suspect effusion. جاي واحد مثلا with fever and something and things like that, you suspect some sort of infection. And history is always important. Okay. Now, what do we have here? Okay. Yeah, so this was called supernormal or super scan. Why white cerebrum? Okay, like Superman or something. It's indicating of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, like the cerebral sign, but infecting only the cortex, which appears restricted on diffusion with images T2 hyper intense, uh, exaggerating the normal gray-white matter di distinctions, more distinct the gray and white matter in an adult patient. This is due to severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy with a globally reduced diffusion throughout the cortex, subcortical white matter also. The gray matter, which is eight times more metabolically active than the white matter, it needs oxygen eight times more than the white matter. The, so it will be much more susceptible to the injury and undergoes diffuse cortical laminar necrosis. On the uh, other MR sequences, the gray-white matter distinction is preserved or may even be exaggerated, accentuated. The gray-white matter, because the gray matter will be edematous, because it's dead or dying, okay? Uh, in the subacute period, the, the worsening edema will become more apparent on the T2 and the flare images and pseudo normalization on the diffusion weighted images. The, the subacute stage. Okay? Now, what's this? Tadpole sign. Tadpole sign. Tadpole Excellent. Atrophy. Indicating what? What kind of disease? Uh, Adult onset? Alexander disease. Excellent. Nice. So, this is what's called the tadpole appearance, which is due to the this thinning of the cervical medullary junction, thinned, okay? With normal midbrain and pons, it's normal, just thinning here. This is what's called tadpole appearance, suggesting of adult onset Alexander disease. By the way, Alexander disease is a fatal autosomal dominant neurodegenerative disorder. There are different kinds, infantile, juvenile, and adult onset, okay? The adult onset, it demonstrates a little bit you know, less severe and slower progression of the disease, and other imaging, the infantile form usually show frontal lobe, white matter, abnormalities with macrocephaly. The juvenile form typically has nodular brainstem lesions and periventricular garlands, it was called this appearance. And the adult form is characterized by tadpole brainstem with selective atrophy of the medulla oblongata and cervical cord. Okay, so Alexander disease in general, it is rare. It's a neuro neurodegenerative disorder. It's fatal. Usually we see it in a juvenile form, but there sometimes you can see it in less severe adult form. Okay. Now, what's this? You can see the cortex and the white matter, the gray matter and the white matter. So what do you think the, the cortex is what? It's what? Thick cortex sign, exactly. The cortex is very thick. You don't see that much of a cortex normally, okay? The white matter, is, uh, the gray matter is very thick. What does that indicate? Nice. Isodense subdural hematomas. There are bilateral subdural hematomas here and there, but they are isodense to the cortex. So they will be, you see them as added to the cortex. Tony? Yani. Let's go back. There is subdural hematoma here. 
and subdumeral hematoma here. You see all of this as the cortex, but it's not. So it's like increased thickness of the cortex, okay? Oh, sorry. We should do MRI will be much better in helping us decide. So uh, for those who don't know, the subdural hematomas are bleeds between the dura matter and the arachnoid matter caused by a sheer stress of the veins. It's a venous bleed, while epidural is usually arterial bleed, okay? Usually due to rotational and or linear forces with low pressure bleeding, my minor trauma who start in the subdural hemorrhage. At imaging, it's typically crescentic in appearance, uh, goes along the cerebral convexities and the acute bleeds, which is less than three days usually, they appear hyperdense because of the clotted blood in the acute stage, okay? While a chronic bleed, which is more than three weeks, usually liquefy, becomes hypodense. In between, subacute stage, it will be isodense. Okay, from three days to three weeks, it will be isodense, difficult to distinguish the uh, blood from uh, gray matter. The acute bleed patient with anemia can also appear iso to hypo. If the patient is anemic with acute bleed, it also can appear iso or hypodense. On the CT, the result is non-visualization of the normal sulcal gyral interface with displacement from the inner table with MR subdural hematomas are readily distinguished. It's easier if it's just unilateral. If unilateral, it's, yes, it will be not easier, but you will see asymmetry. Okay. If it's bilateral, oh, that's difficult. It's your luck. <laughs> okay. So we are coming to a very, very close to an end. What do we have here? Nice. I like it. What does it indicate? Zebra sign. Posterior fossa hemorrhage or superficial siderosis. Exactly. You can see hemorrhage here resulting in hemosiderin deposition between the folia of the cerebellum. Okay, it's just blood hemosiderin depositing between the folia and of the cerebellum. So there is hypo, hypo intense hemosiderin outlining the pons and the cerebellar folia, temporal tips also. It indicates posterior fossa hemorrhage and superficial siderosis. In the adult, the posterior fossa hemorrhage can be caused by traumatic, iatrogenic, ischemic, vascular, neoplastic causes, uh, neoplastic causes especially includes metastasis and hemangioblastoma. What are the tracheal metastases susceptible to hemorrhage? Yes, choriocarcinoma. CTMR. CTMR. CTMR, which oh, are? Melanoma. Choriocarcinoma. Melanoma. 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 Renal. Renal and thyroid. Mm -hmm. CTMR. CTMR. Intracranial CTMR. lesions or metastases that can hemorrhage is the choriocarcinoma, thyroid, melanoma, and renal. Okay? But even in uh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the characteristic, uh, the blood will produce a characteristic streaky appearance of the blood outlining the cerebellar folia, which is the zebra sign. It's hyper intense on CT in the acute phase and hypo intense on T2 weighted images and susceptibility weighted images in the chronic phase because the hemosiderin will form. Okay? Uh, the subarachnoid hemorrhage anywhere along the neuroaxis leads to superficial to will lead to superficial siderosis anywhere. The hemosiderin is deposited along the surface of the brain, spinal cord, and the nerves. On the T2-weighted MR, the linear hypo-intense signal outlines the brain and spinal cord, often with associated demyelination and gliosis. Not in the first time, it should be repeated. According to the severity of the hemorrhage, if it is minor, you might. It just goes away mm -hmm. if it is major hemorrhage or repeated episodes of hemorrhage can uh, lead to accumulation of hemosiderin in the chronic stage. So, I hope you have fun. That will be it. Uh, I hope we covered a lot of signs and appearances that affects the brain. We have some other signs. Maybe we'll do it later. For example, pediatric brain, spinal cord, head and neck, chest. We have some other things. We'll do it in the upcoming sessions.